Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, depending on where you're joining us from. A uh, very warm welcome uh, to all to this IISS webinar uh, on the theme of strategic stability and emerging missile technologies. My name is Bastian Gigerich. I'm the Director for Defense and Military Analysis at the IISS. In February 2021, Russia and the United States agreed to extend the 2010 New Strategic Arms Reduction Treaty New START for a further five years, thereby maintaining stability, transparency, a degree of predictability. However, of course, this takes place in an era of renewed great power competition, uh, of an era of rapid technological change. Um, and I think it is fair to say that most of us feel um, stability is increasingly threatened, perhaps, by emerging technologies, while at the same time, the global arms control architecture is gradually eroding. And of course, multiple states are working on their nuclear and conventional missile programs. Um, uh, some of them uh, are becoming increasingly entangled. There are action-reaction uh, patterns um, and, and regional security dynamics that complicate developments and undermine stability further, perhaps by encouraging arms racing and increasing the risk of confrontation in a crisis. And against this backdrop, we want to discuss how to enhance stability and how to reduce risks. What are some of the key concerns for governments? What actions do they consider to address these concerns? Who and what should future arms control agreements incorporate? And given the increasingly fraught relation or giving increasingly fraught relations between some of the world's major powers, are there areas where um, uh, states can begin to cooperate with each other on shared security concerns to uh, pursue that goal of enhanced stability? Those are also the questions that describe the stuff that the IISS Missile Dialogue Initiative deals with, the our MDI uh, uh, project supported by the German uh, a government, the German MFA, uh, and in that in that framework, uh, uh, we are convening today. I'm very happy that we have a fantastic group of speakers here with us today, able to give us the perspectives of the governments they represent. I will ask uh, each of them to speak for about five minutes each in, in alphabetical order, uh, and uh, it is my pleasure um, uh, to briefly introduce all of them before then turning uh, to our first speaker, who will be uh, Joe Beethworth, uh, Counter Proliferation and Arms Control Center, the director um, uh, of, of that um, uh, 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 center at the FCDO, um, followed by Alexandra Bell, who is a Deputy Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Arms Control Verification and uh, Compliance at the US Department of uh, State, followed by uh, Ambassador Rüdiger Bohn, the Deputy Federal Commissioner for Disarmament and Arms Control at the uh, German MFA, uh, and then uh, Paola debriel Lose, the, the Deputy Assistant Director for Nuclear Disarmament and Non-Proliferation at the French Ministry of um, uh, European and Foreign Affairs. And then last but certainly not least, Alexander Trofimov is the Head of Section in the Department for Non-Proliferation and Arms Control at the uh, Ministry of Foreign Affairs of the Russian Federation. Um, I should say that this event is on the record and uh, will be recorded. We will uh, provide a recording uh, on the ISS webpage that will probably go up um, uh, tomorrow. And uh, after the interventions from our panel, uh, we hope for a lively debate with contributions from uh, the audience. Uh, and uh, you can use the Q&A uh, function uh, provided by this platform. There's a slide up now that shows you how to do that. So you click on that on that uh, Q&A symbol, and then you uh, let us uh, know. Uh, you type up your question, your comment, and we will be able to guide the conversation on that, on that uh, uh, basis. Um, so... We will bring this to a conclusion in about an hour, so I will get out of the way now and turn over to the panel. Um, uh, Joe uh, Beatsworth, if I uh, can turn to you first, thank you very much for joining us. Um, uh, and if you can give us uh, your perspective on these matters, 
Uh, the floor is yours, Joe, please. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you for that introduction and uh, for allowing me the privilege of being the first to speak today amongst this really quite impressive company of fellow speakers. Thank you especially to the International Institute for Strategic Studies for facilitating this important discussion and for all of you online joining from across the world and from different time zones. I hope we're not keeping you up. I know we have limited time, so I will keep my comments as brief as possible to allow for what I'm sure will be a great discussion afterwards. There can be no doubt that we are operating in an increasingly competitive and strategically challenging world. We wouldn't be here today having this conversation if we didn't. The dynamics of the threats to global security and stability are shifting, and they're shifting quickly. And the international structures that our predecessors built to protect us are increasingly under fire. We see a rise of power and technological development from non-state actors that would have been difficult to imagine 100 years ago. But the world is changing and we must learn to change with it. In March this year, the UK government published its integrated review of security, defence, development and foreign policy, setting out the UK's approach to national security and international policy. It outlines three fundamental national interests that bind us together as citizens of the UK those of sovereignty, security and prosperity, alongside our core values of democracy and a commitment to universal human rights, the rule of law, freedom of speech and faith and equality. The integrated review concludes that an important moment for the UK. The world has changed considerably since the 2015 Strategic Defence and Security Review and has, as has the weaker UK's place within it. Importantly, it looks at the new challenges we face and how we, as part of an international community, will look to address them. In this context, the integrated review sets out four overarching objectives. We will make the most of our domestic science and technology expertise, incorporating it as an integral element of our national security and international policy to firmly establish the UK as a global science and technology and responsible cyber power. We'll play a leading role in shaping the open international order of the future, working with partners to reinvigorate the international institutions, laws and norms that enable open societies and economies to flourish. This will help citizens around the world realize the full benefits of democracy, free trade and international cooperation, not least in the future frontiers of cyberspace and space. We will strengthen security and defense at home and overseas working with allies and partners to help us maximize the benefits of openness and protect our people in the physical world and online against a range of growing threats. These include state threats, radicalization and terrorism, serious and organized crime and weapons proliferation. And we will be resilient, we'll build resilience at home and overseas. We will look to improve our ability to anticipate, prevent, prepare for and respond to risks ranging from extreme weather to cyber attacks. This will also involve tackling risks at source, in particular climate change and biodiversity loss, which contribute to destabilization as much as the development of weapon systems. More specifically, looking at missiles and offensive technologies, we recognize that many technologies are dual use in their nature and that the development is increasingly in the hands of private organizations and research institutions. For example, the technology that is developed for civilian space programs can also be used for less benign causes. This brings a new challenge. How do we ensure that the social benefits of technology can be enjoyed worldwide, whilst preventing the use of the same technologies to raise the risk of conflict and misery? It is incumbent on responsible governments to support these private organisations to prevent misappropriation and misuse of their research. But we can only do this together through multilateral action. The integrated review explicitly emphasizes the importance of science and technology and highlights the need to ensure that countries worldwide can come together through stronger international institutions to act on the most pressing shared challenges. The use of the phrase come together and the word shared clearly demonstrate the UK's acknowledgement that no one country and no one sector can meet these challenges in isolation. It's tempting when faced with new or rapidly developing problem to throw away existing solutions and look for something new. The rules-based system that the world has spent so long building is under threat. But new international regimes and agreements take time to create and build in credibility. And meanwhile, technological development marches on in spite of us. 
We have excellent and established tools to help us work together, but sometimes we need to remember how to use them. These regimes provide us with a platform to discuss our collective challenges and work together to strengthen and enhance existing multilateral mechanisms. By building on the foundations of the achievements of the past, we can meet the challenges of the future. I will conclude my remarks at this point by reflecting that although the world in which we find ourselves brings security challenges, our predecessors also had to contend with security challenges and developing missile technologies. So this situation is not really anything new, but by working together as an international community and making the best of the use of the tools at our disposal, we can find a way through. Once again, thank you for allowing me to speak at this event and thank you all for listening. Joe, thank you so much um, for, for those remarks, uh, which set up a, a number of themes that I'm, I'm sure we will want to uh, uh, discuss. Um, uh, you, you spoke about the UK ambition in particular in terms of science and technology. You also mentioned uh, uh, the dual use nature of a lot of things and, 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 specific, and specifically you referred to space, um, uh, uh, which of course might be an area we want to discuss. Uh, uh, and of course, uh, you uh, included a call to strengthen and enhance existing uh, mechanism and pose the question of how new are really the circumstances that we're in um, uh, worthy for debate as well. Um, uh, and I'm sure people will pick that up. Uh, I will now turn uh, to Alexandra Bell. Uh, Alex, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thanks, Bastian. I, I'm honored to be here on this panel, and I'm really grateful that IISS is, is hosting this event. I, I think that, you know, honest conversations about the threats that we face, uh, you know, it's it's critical to identifying areas of mutual interest uh, and and sort of gets us on the road to, to how we reduce risks. Um, uh, to put it plainly, um, uh, I, I'll just note at the front that the United States is in the middle of some extensive uh, policy reviews uh, on our defense posture, nuclear weapons, arms control. Uh, when those are completed, that will really uh, uh, you know, guide U.S. policy on these specific topics being discussed today. But I'll, I'll try to give a, a general overview as much as possible. Uh, to start with, we're just very clear-eyed about the challenges that we're facing today. Uh, we live in a complex strategic environment. Uh, one that cannot be improved with quick or easy fixes. Uh, Russia maintains a formidable nuclear arsenal, uh, is expanding its numbers and kinds of systems, in addition to its strategic forces, which are thankfully capped by the New START Treaty, as you mentioned. Uh, Russia maintains up to 2,000 non-strategic nuclear weapons with an increasing diversity of theater range delivery systems intended to hold U.S. forces and our allies at risk. Uh, it's developing novel and dangerous delivery systems uh, such as the Poseidon unmanned underwater nuclear propelled drone uh, and the Skyfall nuclear powered cruise missile. It's undermined the arms control architecture by producing, testing and fielding banned missile systems in material breach of the Intermediate Range Nuclear Forces Treaty. Uh, each of these actions poses uh, challenges to strategic stability. Collectively, they present a substantial threat to international security. Uh, in the Indo-Pacific, China's rapidly expanding nuclear arsenal, especially when combined with its sophisticated conventional capabilities, also poses a growing strategic threat uh, for the United States. Uh, the scope of China's nuclear warhead and delivery system modernization effort, which is estimated to more than double in size uh, during this decade, uh, their work to establish a nuclear triad, which could also include hypersonic glide vehicles, presents particularly acute challenges. Complicating matters when it comes to nuclear posture and stockpile, China is the least transparent to the P5 nuclear weapon states. Uh, that's unfortunate since transparency and confidence building measures can provide crucial stability and reduce miscalculation. It certainly has in the US-Russian relationship over the past 50 years. Uh, so both Russia and China's strategic postures are quickly evolving and increasingly challenging and destabilizing directions uh, facilitated by advanced technologies. Uh, in addition to the systems I've already mentioned, Russia and China are developing and fielding anti-satellite systems capable of holding critical space assets at risk and sophisticated cyber capabilities that may raise the risk of inadvertent and rapid escalation in crisis or a conflict. Uh, so the United States is really going to refocus resources 
uh, for investments in cutting edge technologies and capabilities that are responsive to the threats that we face. But none of these challenges should be used as a reason to shy away from dialogue or from arms control. Uh, a, future, uh, a future of unconstrained military cooperation is not a foregone conclusion. We can choose a different path. Uh, the United States plans to actively engage countries to identify ways to address existing and emerging strategic threats in ways that enhance uh, national security of the United States, allies and partners, uh, and the world uh, in, a, in a push to reduce the risks of accidents or miscalculations. Uh, that's really the driving sentiment behind the U.S. interim national security strategic guidance, which commits the United States to being a leader in arms control, uh, to really retake a leadership role in arms control, and to pursue new arms control agreements and arrangements where possible and when in our interest. Uh, the commitment was on full display, as you mentioned, in the first few weeks of the administration, when the U.S. and Russia extended the New START Treaty that preserved the treaty's verifiable limits on Russian and US ICBMs, SLBMs, and heavy bombers through February 4th, 2026. That really helps close off one avenue of a potentially costly arms race. It also maintained the treaty's verification regime, which provides critical insight into strategic forces, nuclear forces and, and operations. That kind of transparency provides stability, predictability, uh, and that's just the beginning of the administration's efforts to address 21st century challenges. Uh, and we must use the time provided by the extension wisely. As a first step, the United States and Russia are pursuing a strategic stability dialogue, hopefully that can get underway this summer. Uh, ideally, the dialogue will focus on areas of strategic concerns and help us identify areas of mutual interest, such dis should such discussions prove fruitful. Uh, the United States would examine pursuing additional arms control agreements and arrangements with Russia in consultation, uh, obviously with our Congress, with U.S. allies and partners uh, that aim to address uh, all Russian nuclear weapons. The administration also seeks to reduce dangers uh, from China's growing nuclear arsenal in hopes that Beijing will come to see arms control is in their national security interests. It's not a trap designed to, to weaken China's defenses, but a mechanism uh, to reduce risk and control the chances, uh, contain the chances of uh, an uncontrollable arms race. Uh, we recognize uh, that arms control um, can be an effective tool to reduce nuclear dangers and manage uh, differences, uh, but it needs to be uh, paired with the existence of a safe, secure, and effective deterrent. Uh, as such, the United States remains fully engaged in our regular efforts to ensure extended deterrence commitments to our allies uh, that they remain strong and credible. We routinely consult with our allies in Europe and the Indo-Pacific uh, regarding their perceptions of the threats they face, how we can collectively deter aggression, and how arms control can best support uh, U.S. and allied security postures. Uh, just recently, I co-chaired uh, with the Department of Defense uh, the latest meeting of the U.S.-Japan Extended Deterrence Dialogue to engage with our Japanese colleagues uh, on these types of questions. Ultimately, to manage emerging security challenges, we have to adapt uh, arms control to the new threats we're facing while also preserving proven approaches that are effective uh, for more familiar weapons, such as New START's verifiable limits on ICL ICBMs, SLBMs, and heavy bombers. Uh, but the United States can't do this alone. As, as Joe said, um, this is going to take a collective effort. We encourage uh, countries, including Russia and China, uh, to engage in ways that are constructive, substantive, credible, uh, and to refrain all of us from destabilizing activities. The United States is committed to working uh, with countries when it's in our common interests uh, and strongly urge all countries to abide by these basic tenets of uh, maintaining stability. Uh, history shows that when they do, uh, countries, all of us, are safer and so is the world. Uh, so I'll stop there, but I look forward to questions. Thank you. Alexandra, thank you so much for your remarks. You, you, you started off by saying um, uh, one needs an honest and, and clear-eyed discussion about the challenges. Uh, I think you outlined how the U.S. government sees those challenges in, in very clear terms. You spoke uh, uh, about uh, the effort that is underway to refocus, refocus resources um, uh, to respond to those challenges uh, and the thinking that is ongoing in, in Washington and elsewhere. 
Uh, and then you spoke about the need for, for dialogue to identify ways forward um, and, and focus that dialogue on, on strategic issues of mutual interest. I think there's probably, uh, there are probably one or two people who might want to pursue uh, the uh, question of what those might be um, and where precisely one, one would go. We have about 100 people in the audience here, so I'm sure um, uh, I can encourage a few to, to type up their questions as we go along. Alexandra, thank you so much. Um, I will now turn to uh, uh, Rüdiger Bohn, uh, who is joining us from Berlin. Ambassador, the floor is yours. Yeah, thank you, uh, Bastian. Um, I would like to start in an almost uh, classical manner by quoting my, my minister, the German foreign minister, Heiko Maas, who said that uh, the year 2021 is a watershed year for arms control. Um, and indeed, uh, the NPT, the Non-Proliferation Treaty, the central pillar of, of the arms control archi architecture is at a critical juncture. Um, it is now important that we remain actively committed to securing the success of the treaty at the review conference later this year. Germany is active in a, in a number of uh, initiatives uh, that have, I would call it, a bridge building uh, nature like NPDI and the Stockholm Initiative. And of course, it means that we need tangible progress in nuclear disarmament and arms control uh, for a successful uh, NPT review conference, but, of all, uh, but above all for the Euro-Atlantic and global security security and stability. Um, against this background, it was extremely helpful that this year started with a, with a strong positive signal, the extension of the new START treaty for another five years. And in our view, the fact that the new Biden administration dealt with the new START uh, treaty on day one of being in office highlights a serious commitment to arms control. And we hope that this will create a, a new momentum, a new impetus for diplomacy in general uh, and for reinforced multilateralism and for strengthening and reviving arms control. Uh, we hope that the new start extension is the beginning of a new process, not the end, and um, that it provides the basis for negotiating a broader US-Russian future arms control arrangement. We hear respective announcements from both capitals. Apparently, both sides want to follow broader approaches that go beyond New START. We hear from, from the US that they would like to advance arms control that addresses all of its nuclear weapons, uh, which means going beyond strategic weapons. And we hear from Russia the reference to the notion of the strategic equation, which means addressing all factors uh, with an impact on strategic stability, including non-nuclear uh, capabilities. Given these different approaches, uh, possible future negotiations will most certainly be complex and complicated. Nevertheless, we welcome the proposed summit between the US and the Russian president. Uh, we think it's also important that the US and Russia quickly continue bilateral strategic talks and, and arms control negotiations. So what are our expectations in Germany regarding future arrangements? Um, we think that the idea of further reductions in strategic nuclear arsenals should be reconsidered. There is this uh, proposal by then President Obama that he made in 2013. Uh, on an additional one third reduction of strategic weapons in the framework of, of the New START Treaty. I think that remains an interesting approach that would no doubt strengthen the NPT uh, process dramatically. Um, secondly, we think we should broaden the scope. Uh, for Europeans, uh, it is important to capture all uh, Russian nuclear systems, including high destabilizing doomsday or so-called doomsday systems, such as the Poseidon, tor Poseidon torpedo or the uh, Buravesnik missile, uh, but of course also non-strategic weapons. In this field, we see a massive uh, qualitative and quantitative disparity in favor of Russia that poses a threat to European security. Uh, third, my third point is that we should adapt arrangements to new technologies and, and security challenges uh, and new security domains like artificial intelligence and weapon systems, hypersonic missiles, lethal autonomous weapon systems, uh, outer space, cyberspace, um, because these new uh, systems will fundamentally change the nature of warfare, will impact on deterrence and defense, and will create a new complexity and amb ambiguity coming along with a, with a high risk of miscalculation and unwanted escalation, not to speak of access um, by non-state actors. So here we think we need new uh, approaches, new ideas. Uh, Germany has been very active here to raise the awareness and to discuss first policy solutions in um, a cycle of conflict 
inferences. Uh, apparently, one important approach are norms and rules for responsible use or, ba or, or norms based on responsible behavior. That means that um, we are thinking beyond object-based approaches, uh, beyond counting tanks and aircraft and move towards banning or prescribing certain behaviors. The key elements could be application of international law, risk reduction measures, verification, attribution issues. Examples for this ongoing discussions are of course the current debates on lethal autonomous weapon systems um, in Geneva, on outer space security, on cyberspace security. One word on China. Um, we are, of course, also concerned about the growing military capabilities um, um, uh, of China. We, we, we think that growing global power comes with growing responsibility, including in the arms control field. The latest CPRI report on military expenditures showed there has been a steady long-term growth uh, in, in the Chinese military budget that has stimulated disproportionate growth of other military budgets in the Indo-Pacific uh, region. So from our point of view, it would be extremely desirable that China enters kind of a strategic dialogue with the US and, and perhaps with Russia uh, and works with um, the US on nuclear risk reduction mechanisms to start with. I would also uh, briefly turn to the field of missile technology and delivery systems. There are a number of well-known challenges here, nuclear, non-nuclear, entanglement, problematic ambiguity in doctrines and systems, um, missiles and cruise missile proliferation, increased availability to non-state -st actor. So this was actually the background against which we initiated the missile dialogue initiative uh, two years ago, together with IISS. Um, and we think that with, with uh, the Missile Dialogue Initiative, we have now a unique venue that brings together diplomatic, the diplomatic world and uh, expert, expert community. And it's, uh, in my opinion, a good platform to develop better understanding of missile-related threat perceptions and policy solutions. Uh, one arrangement, also not legally binding, that, that currently moves back to the center of arms control discussions in this field is the Hague Code of Conduct, HCOG. Um, HCOG remains uh, the only multilateral instrument to address proliferation of ballistic missiles uh, apart from uh, export control regimes. And we think a full implementation and universal, universalization is, is key here. The best way to encourage states to join um, HCOG is to increase the code's attractiveness by improving implementation um, uh, of its transparency building measures, especially um, it would be important to develop a clear definition of what a ballistic missile is and, and to discuss uh, criteria to improve the pre-launch notifications. Um, Finally, it is also important um, uh, not to overlook uh, non-proliferation. Um, and it's now the time to reunite nuclear non-proliferation efforts. Uh, with regard to the JCPOA with Iran, um, this arrangement is, 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 as you all know, in a decisive phase and, and Germany is proud to be part of the E3 and others uh, that, uh, as we speak, negotiate um, a new solution in, in Vienna. Uh, DPRK in North Korea, this is a unique case, uh, the only country that first violated and then left the NPT. And uh, of course, DPRK, uh, we, we see a, a steady uh, build up of nuclear and delivery capacities. Um, there is obviously no clear answer how to contain these challenges, but global unity and resolve are certainly more required than ever. Germany is ready to assume responsibility. Um, so we, we chaired the 1718 Sanctions Committee in the Security Council uh, for, for two years. And um, of course, we welcome a, a thorough US review on DPRK policy and stand ready to support with diplomatic efforts. Yeah, uh, thank you for your attention. I would also like to thank uh, once again IISS, and I think it's fair to say that the MDI hit a nerve as today's event shows. Um, and yeah, I'm looking forward to a discussion uh, on, on the NDQ Q and A session. Thank you. Well, you got. Thank you very much um, uh, for that, for the, for those remarks, uh, which which touched on really a, a, a large number of things. Um, uh, you spoke about. Um, uh, uh, new systems, new technologies, expanding the scope in, 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 in a number of ways. 
uh, uh, you spoke about the potential uh, of existing mechanisms that perhaps uh, will be looked at, um, such as Edgecock, and, and I can already see one or two questions are going in that direction as well, which we will turn to uh, uh, in a minute. And of course, you you pointed out the the role that uh, uh, Germany has has uh, assumed in terms of uh, trying to create venues and and conversations uh, uh, to uh, move those discussions forward. Thank you very much for that. I will now turn to uh, Paris um, and uh, Paola de Villeloso um, from the uh, French Ministry of European and Foreign Affairs. Uh, please, the floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much uh, to uh, Mr. Gigerich. Um, thank you also to, uh, to uh, my colleagues in Berlin, the US and the UK uh, for their presentation. And thanks to the IIS for organizing uh, this uh, very interesting um, panel. Uh, actually, we would uh, maybe uh, focus on uh, new missile technologies, as this is uh, the topic of this, this specific panel, maybe less on general arms control. Um, what we see today uh, in the field of arms control is uh, a very concerning situation. Um, of uh, a deployment, uh, a, a new race competition uh, between uh, big powers regarding, uh, regarding uh, new uh, armaments and uh, a global arms control architecture uh, under, um, under threat with the, the fall of the INF Treaty, uh, Open Sky Treaty. Uh, and uh, what's uh, in Europe, uh, also of the, uh, the FCE. So we, we see many states uh, wish to distance themselves from norms and arms control as seen as constraints. Um, and we can see that in Asia in particular, because we have absolutely no arms control instruments in Asia uh, with new nuclear power, with PIK situation and a rise of uh, Chinese uh, arsenal. So this is quite uh, worrying. Um, this is par par particularly accurate in the field of missiles uh, because we see uh, in the last 10 years, we saw a very strong and uh, rapid development of ballistic missiles programs and space programs in Iran, but also of ballistic missiles programs in the PIK. Uh, with uh, a, a very quick development of long ranges uh, of precision uh, strike capabilities uh, of uh, how to, uh, to, to integrate different warheads uh, on the means of delivery with different uh, means of delivery uh, with solid propellants uh, and so on. So if you look uh, at the at the strategic landscape, we're not talking only about um, new uh, missile technologies uh, among nuclear powers with responsibilities at the UN Council, uh, UN uh, Security Council, but we are talking about real proliferation uh, of such new missiles capabilities. And uh, for instance, if we take the example of hypersonics, uh, of course, all nuclear powers. Uh, uh, are developing uh, hypersonics capabilities, but we see um, we can see that this, these capabilities may proliferate elsewhere. Uh, China is developing such. So uh, we see here that we are observing a new trend. Uh, but is that completely new? The question is uh, the impact on strategic stability about these new technologies. Missile, uh, in the missile field. Actually, um, it's quite difficult to answer that question. Uh, the question is all new missile technologies are destabilizing and in which conditions could, could these missile technologies be destabilizing? Uh, actually, uh, we are talking a lot about hypersonic missiles because this is, a, this is a seen as a technology, technological shift uh, in the field of missiles. But if you look, if you assess the situation more carefully, uh, you can see that the, the objective of such capabilities 
is to uh, reinforce the credibility of deterrence. So if you are speaking about nuclear powers among themselves, it's part of the, of the nuclear deterrence uh, equilibrium balance, if I may. So as such, it's not destabilizing. Uh, is the first aim of such capabilities is to reinforce credibility of the veterans and to ensure also uh, uh, being in the technological competition for Europeans. Also, it's important, uh, not only for other powers uh, across uh, across the world. Um, what is destabilizing? First, it is the use of such uh, new missiles technologies. So as you know, uh, what is as far as France is concerned, uh, deterrence uh, is a strategic weapons and not a weapon of use. I mean, tactically, uh, it's not a tactical weapon. So the question is uh, related to the uh, to the to the doctrine of use and uh, to the doctrine as such. Uh, what we can see is that what is destabilizing, in our view especially in Europe, is the development of such missile capabilities, uh, new missile capabilities, um, with a very short reaction time, um, often uh, on dual system, uh, so that we don't know, based on ambiguity, so that we don't know which war, kind of, of warhead is uh, there, so nuclear or conventional, with doctrines based on a continuum between conventional and nuclear, uh, so that there is no clarity in the doctrine of use. And often also uh, we can see a development of such weapons associated with uh, more aggressive uh, doctrines uh, or with a, a lack of, of transparency regarding the arsenal's doctrine of use. So uh, in our views, it's not the system as such which is destabilizing, but the doctrine uh, uh, associated and the political landscape associated. So in our view, uh, in that field, um, the first uh, and uh, more most useful answer uh, would be to begin with confidence and transparency building measures on such systems in order to reduce risk and to increase confidence among the stakeholders. So, as my German colleague said, uh, the, the Hcock is the only uh, instrument we have regarding ballistic missiles. Such an approach based on transparency is interesting uh, regarding uh, these types of capabilities. Uh, and uh, it will be my last point. Uh, we need uh, also to address the proliferation risk uh, related to such capabilities and also related to. Uh, other types of uh, new um, new missile systems. We speak a lot about hypersonics, but I think uh, uh, really uh, a new capability, not new, a capability uh, of concern is also the development of unmanned aerial vehicles in states, in other states, and also by non-state actors. We have seen that in the Middle East. So uh, these little systems can be very destabilizing because they are very, uh, they are not easy to attribute. They are very flexible, very easy to use. Uh, so they have a high destabilizing uh, potential. Uh, and we face a non-controlled proliferation of such systems. So the MTCR is dealing with all this, but we believe that we should really focus our international efforts on proliferation of such systems worldwide uh, in uh, hands of actors uh, who may have a near responsible uh, use of them. And I will finish here. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for, for those remarks, um, for pointing to some of these new trends uh, and making that distinction between the technology and the and the doctrine, if I may simplify uh, uh, quite a bit here, but but in the interest of time, um, uh, uh, which I think is an important point and uh, stressing that proliferation uh, dimension uh, as you just have uh, towards the end of your remarks. Thank you very much for that. Last but not least, I will now turn to uh, Alexander Trofimov. Uh, the floor is yours. Thank you. Could you hear me? 
Uh, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and good morning to some of you. Uh, I would like to thank to WIWS for the invitation. And uh, while preparing my remarks, I was guided by question post, uh, posed by organizers. So it will be, I will try to answer them, and it will be very difficult to be in the time frame, <laughs> but I will try my best. Uh, Question about influence of missile technology on regional and global security, on strategic stability, as well as on balance of forces is not the new one. This specific topic pops up as a center of discussion each time when key missile countries are developing or implementing new technological solutions related to modernization of their military or well missile potential. Uh, this issue was discussed already many times, at least uh, in uh, uh, Russian American at Russian American talks and Russia US format, and both sides uh, have gained a lot of experience in this missile area. Uh, and uh, I believe it's important to note that uh, this topic uh, was never considered as a standing alone issue uh, or in isolation from other factors. Uh, affecting strategic situation. Um, as a rule, uh, the issue was a part of broader strategic dialogue between Moscow and Washington, and even the INF Treaty that at the first glance seems to be a separate issue was designed not in a vacuum back in time. Uh, parties then were leaning on existing agreement on other strategic issues and were considering uh, the possibilities for other complementary ar arrangements. So uh, today, as we believe, uh, the comprehensive and integrated approach is as relevant as ever. So different aspects that affect international security are increasingly interrelated. As also, uh, this is our position, as uh, Ambassador Bourne put it also, and. Uh, that is why we consistently speak for systemic Russia-US dialogue on strategic agenda, taking into account all factors that are relevant in this field and their inter interrelationship. Uh, what we offer to a new US administration is to start new phase of our interaction on strategic stability uh, by conducting joint assessment of concern that each side has accumulated. Uh, sub subsequently, it would allow us to try to look for mutually accepted ways, mutually accepted ways to remove these concerns using political diplomatic tools. And we believe that this approach is a constructive one, uh, more constructive than putting in the center of discussion the issue of what weapons are destabilizing and what are not. Uh, certainly, we have our own uh, assessment on this issue. In particular, for us, it's more than obvious that unilateral and unrestricted development of global missile defense system undermines strategic stability. Also, we consider as destabilizing, for example, actions aimed at deployment of SLBMs with low yield warheads, which task is or might be limited nuclear use. Uh, however, it's our belief that a result-oriented dialogue should envisage not putting labels, but a specification of problems that are to be considered jointly. And as uh, Alexandra Bell mentioned, now it's time to start our discussion on strategic agenda, and we hope to do it soon. Uh, after Russia showed a fair amount of patience and new US administration came in, sites managed to reach agreement on the new START extension. And this was a step that created a foundation for joint work and joint advance, uh, joint advance towards possible arrangements or agreements. And Russia is fully ready for that. We have a concept for this work and my superiors outlined it publicly in several uh, occasions. And as also uh, Rudiger Bond mentioned, we propose to US colleagues to craft new strategic equations, equation that would include all offensive and defensive weapons, nuclear and non-nuclear that are capable of accomplishing strategic tasks. What concerns offensive weapons? We propose to put particular attention to means of delivery, uh, of delivery usable for launching a hypothetical strike against the national territory of the other side. And when we speak about defensive weapons, we mean relevant missile defense system. Uh, for us, there is no alternative 
uh, to taking into account the missile defense factor in new strategic equations. Uh, besides, we have to touch upon seriously the issue of militarization of outer space, including the prevention of arms race there. Uh, this is a framework of our concept. Uh, I don't believe that it would be a right thing right now to go deeper on this issue in public, as well as to anticipate specific ways to address problems or uh, mention the possible solutions. That would be not only premature, but also counterproductive from the um, point of view of negotiation practice. Uh, what's important for the sites is to start substantive talks and to move where possible towards negotiations on specific directions. I also would like to know that the central pillar of our approach to the strategic dialogue with US colleagues remains the same as ever. And that is principles of equality and mutual consideration of concerns. We exclude the situation when Russia-US interaction in strategic area turns into one way street. Uh, for example, we are not going to force US side to consider missile defense issues. No way. However, uh, our colleagues have to understand that without proper consideration of this issue, of this factor, new agreements are, are not possible. Accordingly, if the US wants to reach an agreement or agreements that fully meet the task of maintaining strategic stability and national security of uh, both countries, we have to discuss the issue of missile defense. Uh, as to including the factor of conventional long range precision strike systems into strategic equation, um, we don't want to get ahead of the events and to go in details right now on public. But it's fully evident for us that in modern conditions, dimension systems are an effective tool to accomplish at least some of strategic tasks. They have somehow limited but obvious counterforce potential, as we assess this. Uh, for instance, they might be used alongside with nuclear weapons uh, in, in offensive actions, including launching a first strike to neutralize or weaken the deterrence potential. Uh, I also believe it's important to remind that non-nuclear and conventional missiles are already falling into the scope of existing Russia-US arms control agreements. Specifically, the sites agreed that ICBMs and SLBMs are counted under the new START without distinction if they are nuclear uh, or potentially not nuclear. So we have to include conventional strategic, strategic weapons into new agreements. No doubt on this. How to do it? The sites should decide at the negotiation table. So here I will stop. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for for outlining the uh, position, um, uh, Russia's position on these on these matters, and and uh, I think picking up some of the uh, elements that were that were discussed and and, and clarifying or, or indicating um, how how you think about it. Um, uh, we have we are short on time. Um, I will uh, ask your permission to perhaps add on a few minutes um, uh, at the end, but but I know you're all busy, so I, I, I will will have to. Uh, come to a close um, relatively soon. But what I will do is there's there are lots of questions that have come up. Maybe the speakers have already had a chance to scan them a bit on that on that Q and A function. But but I will I will I will group together four or five now, and then I will return to the panel um, uh, for everybody to have. And I really need to ask you to limit yourself to a two minute burst in response to these questions that I'm that I'm putting out there. Obviously. I know you will have to be selective, uh, but uh, it's it's a it's a very rich uh, menu to start with. And the first one um, I'm going to uh, use is from uh, Pavel Podvik, who's who's of course a uh, an MDI advisory board member, um, and he's he's saying a new start extension was of course a positive development, but uh, it overshadowed the post INF situation. And the question he asks is. Should we expect progress on the Russian proposal of a moratorium on the deployment of INF range systems in Europe? Was it discussed? What do we think about that? So that's one that's one question um, I'm I'm putting out there. Uh, a second one uh, is on uh, hypersonics, um, uh, and it is posed by Douglas Berry, uh, one of our ISS colleagues. 
and it's to all panel members, is there a need to manage or limit the introduction of potentially dual capable hypersonic boost glide and hypersonic cruise missiles? And if so, what mechanisms might be considered to uh, achieve that? Uh, there was a different question um, uh, by someone else who, who said that maybe you know one of the most verifiable types of arms control uh, are limits and restrictions and bans on missile flight testing. Um, uh, it, does that feature uh, in the thinking? That's the second uh, question. Third question uh, uh, goes back to uh, MTCR and HCOC, uh, which got mentions uh, uh, on the margins. Um, could these existing frameworks be adapted to better capture emerging technologies? Uh, and should they be more seriously enforced uh, to strengthen multilateralism between major security powers? And finally, um, uh, and I, I apologize in advance to the many good questions we didn't get to. Um, uh, Andre uh, uh, Gubin is asking um, uh, a question on, on further start process. Is there any possibility to add into a future text non-traditional strategic weapons such as long range uh, uh, drones, uh, underwater vehicles, nuclear, nuclear powered cruise missiles, um, uh, and uh, uh, other uh, uh, systems of the future. I mean, I guess, I guess we, we, we don't want to speculate too much. Um, uh, uh, how crucial is China's involvement into this process? So I think um, uh, that is an extremely rich menu. Um, uh, I hope it gives you all something to tie, uh, to tie into. Um, uh, and uh, I'll ask each of you for a, a, a two-minute burst um, uh, on these on these matters, focusing on the one that you identify for yourself as the priority one, please, if I may. Um, and uh, we'll go back uh, to uh, Joe, please, to uh, kick us off. Joe. My apologies. I was so busy frantically writing those down that I think I may have missed some of them. So. Um... Uh, I, I believe you asked about the expansion of existing uh, regimes, or it may be that I've read that <laughs> and you didn't mention it at all. But if I if I could sort of use that um, as as a hook, really, um, I think the uh, exist you know being able to sort of work with the regimes we've got, the tools we've got. As I said earlier, you know we have some excellent tools, and it's about finding ways to use those um, and how they can be expanded to. Um, because really what those rules, those tools are there to do is reduce, you know, increase transparency, lower the risk of accidents, misinterpretations. Um, so it really is about remembering that that is at, what is at the very core of those uh, initiatives and those tools and finding ways to uh, update them so that they remain relevant and um, still address the issue of global stability, even though the technology itself has moved on. Um, I think uh, that will be the only comment I'd make on there. I think I will leave it to uh, Russian and American colleagues to com uh, comment on New Start, if I may. Thank you. Joe, oh, thank you very much. And uh, that uh, sets up Alexandra for, for her response or reaction. Yes, uh, uh, so on the INF issue, I think it's important to remember when discussing a moratorium that Russia already deployed the SSC-8, uh, you know, so, so the, the, the deployment moratorium was a, a bit insufficient. Uh, that said, the United States and Russia, you know, need to talk about a broad range of issues and, you know, including why it was that we decided to ban intermediate range missiles, you know, in the first place. Uh, on uh, HGVs, obviously this is a, is a buzzy topic. We have to consider steps that we can take uh, to promote the responsible development and, and use of this technology, you know, in, in the attempt to preserve a stable uh, international environment. Um, overall, uh, we just need to get to work. And the acknowledgement uh, that I have that I hope all people have is the nuclear weapon states don't have a patent on good ideas here. Uh, it's why the United States promotes initiative like the creating the environment for nuclear disarmament, the uh, International Partnership for Nuclear Disarmament Verification, terrible acronym, really good group, uh, focusing on how we get 
uh, to these next steps, how we create the verification tools and technologies uh, that we need for, for warheads, for missiles, other delivery systems, uh, how we create the diplomatic solutions that deal with the security environment that we live in, the, the reason countries feel like they need to have these systems to get us to a better place. Uh, you know, whether it's, uh, you know, confidence building measures, treaties, political agreements, there's no perfect or singular way to do any of this, to deal with all of these problems. Uh, you know, we have to work together. The biggest mistake that we can make is assuming we aren't capable of solving these problems. That's what people need to keep in mind. This is this is not a place for pessimists. We have to deal with these problems because of the threats they pose to our countries, to the world. It, it's it's simply unavoidable. We have to work together. Thanks. Alexander, thank you very much. Uh, Rüdiger. Yeah, um, I would first turn to the question on, on the Hay Code of Conduct and how to um, improve the age cook in a way that it would uh, cover uh, better new technologies um, and how the age cook could be better enforced. Um, I'm not um, tremendously optimistic that uh, we can uh, improve age cook in a revolutionary manner. Um, it's, um, as I said, it's a it's, um, politically binding arrangement. Um, and the first priorities for us are universalization, bringing more countries into the age cook regime, and then improving the implementation by finding good criteria for the uh, things that are, are already part of the of the code, pre-launch um, notifications, and so on. Um, um, and uh, already this is extremely difficult to achieve. So here I'm, um, I'm more re I think we should aim for more realistic objects. Of course, the age cook would, would offer um, would offer a good platform to discuss um, uh, new missile systems and new uh, technology uh, weapons, but we are not we are not there yet. Uh, all these things are uh, currently um, uh, yeah, developed by many countries. Apparently, new missile new missiles are um, um, an important um, capability for countries that cannot afford, for instance, good aircraft and good fighter pilots. And, and today, good missiles can perform operations that, that in the past only aircraft could perform. So there is a trend now to acquire more and more missiles that uh, I guess cannot be stopped by HCOG alone. It needs uh, uh, more efforts. Uh, and then I would, um, um, Bastian, a little bit deviate from your instructions. I saw a, a question in the chat uh, directly to, to me on a lethal, autonomous a lethal autonomous weapon systems and drones and um, how we think we can harmonize the different positions Germany has on, on these two types of weapons. Uh, for us, a lethal autonomous, autonomous weapon system or laws are completely different uh, from, from drones. Drones are still operated by human beings, whereas we, as cons we are concerned about uh, uh, lethal autonomous weapon systems that are not anymore anymore operated by, by, by human beings, but that that are um, yeah, operated by themselves, uh, defining targets, fighting targets. So um, that's why we, we clearly uh, see a distinction here. And uh, there was then the second question, what about the, the FCAS discussion in Germany? It's about the new, um, uh, the new aircraft system developed by a number of European countries. Um, and um, also the question on, on, on arming drones or not arming drones. This is a difficult discussion in Germany. It's not over yet. That's what I say, what, what I can say at the moment. But I think it, it is um, also, uh, absolutely fine that there is a broad public discussion on these new um, weapon systems, and that not uh, that not simply a, a government can can uh, decide, uh, um, yeah, virtually overnight, uh, which weapons weapon systems to acquire. I think I think it's good that we have this public discussion in Germany, although it doesn't make the uh, decision making process for the government easier. Thank you. Thank you, uh, really. As, as a fellow German, I'm, uh, uh, I'm going to take an issue with your definition of overnight, but uh, uh, that's, uh, that's something uh, that, we can, that we can discuss some, some other time, perhaps. Um, uh, but I will turn now to uh, Paola. Um, I don't know whether you intended to uh, pick up that issue of, of hypersonics, uh, given that you mentioned it in your remarks, but please, the, the floor is yours. 
and you need to unmute yourself. Yeah, there Thank we go. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, uh, regarding the question uh, related to uh, dual hypersonic uh, cruise missiles, um, how to manage them. Um, I think we have to face first the issue of transparency. Uh, I was trying to, to, uh, to say, uh, so this is the first step. Um, and uh, especially uh, regarding uh, the major destabilizing factor is the dual capability of such systems. The fact that there is an ambiguity uh, of course, this is not new. Uh, we have uh, already ballistic missiles uh, uh, with dual capability um, uh, in Russia, in China. Uh, but what we face in Europe is uh, the high speed of, uh, of these systems. Uh, that's why uh, transparency uh, is the first reduction uh, risk reduction measures in our view. Uh, to answer another question uh, of the of the of the panel, uh, not of the panel, but of the of attending, uh, France is is very transparent about uh, our program. Uh, so um, so we announced it uh, a while ago. So uh, it's part of of ensuring uh, a critical uh, French deterrence, uh, uh, taking into account the fact that our, our deterrence is based on on strict sufficiency orders. Um, regarding the question on Hcock and, um, and MCCR, uh, I think uh, more can be done within the MCCR in order to control new technologies. Uh, so there is an ongoing process of adapting uh, the, direct, the, the guidelines to the, to the technologies, but more can be done maybe. Uh, regarding Hcock, authority, as my German uh, as with Ambassador Bonn said, uh, is to ensure first uh, what we have, I mean, to enforce the code and to ensure universalization and full implementation of the code. So this is the first uh, step. Thank you. Thank you very much. Alexander. <laughs> okay, thank you. Uh, a bit about the new start question. So um, New START treaty is crafted as it is. And uh, what we have in ICBMs have a bombers and SLBMs. These are uh, only strategic systems that are covered by this treaty. And we um, cannot include anything else in. But if we speak about the treaty to follow New START or to replace it or the additional one, there we can include anything, uh, any new strategic weapon as we have with nuclear or non-nuclear. It's uh, the matter of negotiation. But uh, new start it is good enough to include uh, Russian hypersonic weapons. Uh, I mean, our hypersonic system Avangard is falling into new start. So this is uh, a first example ever when hypersonic weapon is covered by an existing treaty. And I hope if and when the United States has a similar weapon, it will also fall into the scope of the new start while it's still there. Uh, and a couple of words on the, the post-INF situation. Uh, we in Russia closely look to this uh, situation. Uh, thank you for reminding uh, about our initiative. I would I would like to. Mm, clarify that uh, this moratoria on non-placing is not about Europe only, it's worldwide, uh, as uh, my president uh, presented uh, this initiative. But we have a special focus on Europe, obviously. And uh, here I have a question for everybody, for all my colleagues, and I don't require immediate answer. Why do you think we deployed in European part of Russia, the missile an M729, also called SSC-8. Please don't answer, why do you think it's there? And then I insist, this uh, uh, missile mm, was perfectly in the INF Treaty. It uh, does not fly uh, more than five, five, zero kilometers. And, uh, but we understand that this is concerned, was, this concern was presented to us many times. This is why part of our initiative, uh, as we clarified it, is to allow to verify 
uh, that uh, in the region Kaliningrad, of Kaliningrad, just to start, the missile is not there. It's part of our initiative, the verification measure of the post-INF situation. Uh, obviously, as I mentioned in my remark, this is not, uh, not should be a one-way street. Uh, we, will, we have our concerns. And in this post-INF situation, we would like to verify something else. Uh, and we presented it in the statement of my president on October 20 or 26, sorry, I forget the exact date, last year. Uh, we, we are allowed to verify the absence of this missile in question and other, if any, INF missiles in Kaliningrad region and uh, our, uh, and we verify the absence of the same missiles in uh, at base in Poland and Romania. Poland not existing yet at the EGC show. This is, you know, two-way streets. We have concerns, you have concerns, and we can find the way how to manage this concern. This is not just a moratorium. We try, to, uh, we try to have a verifiable moratorium. This is about transparency as well. So please uh, consider one uh, more time our initiative. It could bring more stability and transparency in this area, at least in Europe. Uh, so uh, answering to the question post, posed by one of uh, the persons who uh, joined the event. Uh, yes, Russia hopes that uh, the post-INF initiative posed by my country will have at least some success. Uh, thank you very much. Alexander, thank you. Thank you very much for, for that response. I think we'll have to live with the uh, very different assessments uh, of NATO member states of the capabilities of the uh, 9M729 uh, um, uh, compared to uh, what you what you described, um, uh, but uh, I, 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 I'm, I'm really sorry that we have to bring this to a close because I feel we're, we're only just getting started, and and there are, there are so many things on the table that are worth discussing. Um, but what we of course uh, try to achieve with this event is to get a conversation going, get a discussion going, uh, point out some specific areas that that might be worth uh, exploring in in multilateral, bilateral, and, and, and other settings. Um, we will continue to work on these issues, among other things, through the Missile Dialogue Initiative, um, uh, which serves as the framework for this event today. So I'd like to thank uh, the uh, five governments uh, uh, who uh, participated today and, and presented their, their views and, and enabled us uh, to understand a little better where the where the perspectives are and where people are coming from, uh, and 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 help us understand the the many challenges and the the complicated uh, nature of this of this conversation. Uh, we will make sure that we share with you um, with the speakers the uh, uh, the transcript of the questions that were asked uh, because there were a number that we didn't get to, and I'm sure you'll you'll uh, uh, like to see them uh, because they are further food for thought. Uh, some of them are really, truly excellent and it's just uh, uh, a uh, limitation of this format and our time uh, together today that we didn't get to them, but we will make sure that you will receive them um, and, and maybe uh, uh, one or two of them even spark further conversation. So um, with that, uh, I'd like to thank all of you who participated uh, uh, today, who asked excellent questions. Uh, I make apologies for my poor uh, chairmanship that we didn't get to more of them, uh, but uh, we heard very important statements. We heard uh, a lot of uh, a detailed discussion about uh, what one can take forward. We also heard, obviously, about the differences of view. Um, uh, that is uh, a part of this exchange. Um, uh, but uh, as many of you said today, uh, we need to start somewhere. This is too important to not talk. Um, so uh, thank you very much for uh, contributing to this conversation today. And I hope to see you all again soon uh, in an MDI framework or other IISS events. Thank you so much. Have a good rest of the day and uh, speak to you again soon. Bye-bye for now.